Hey guys, this is Real Appalachia with Shane. And Melody. And today we're back in Johnson City, Tennessee. That's right. Talking a little bit about the history of Little Chicago. Yes, and the mob and Al Capone's presence in Johnson City. Speaking of Al Capone, Capone's restaurant right behind us. We are Welcome. right outside of Capone's, yes. yes. On a chilly day, but we're going to tell you a little bit more about Little Chicago, so stick in here with us. That's right. Al Capone was a notorious gangster in Chicago who rose to prominence during the Prohibition era of the 1920s to the early 1930s, a time during which the legal production of alcohol was banned nationally, the key word being legal. Al Capone helped found and become the boss of the Chicago outfit, also known as the Southside Gang, that engaged in organized crime, including the illegal distribution of alcohol. Capone loved the attention that came his way and was seen as a modern-day Robin Hood by many Chicagoans due to the unpopularity of the prohibition laws and Capone's own personal charisma and charitable donations from his ill-gotten wealth. Capone's reputation continued to grow nationally, especially with his alleged involvement in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929, which resulted in the brutal deaths of seven members and affiliates of the rival Northside gang. These murders turned the tide of public opinion against Capone, and newspapers went on to label him public enemy number one as he continued to dominate national headlines. Hollywood movie studios glamorized gangsters in films like Little Caesar, starring Edward G. Robinson, which was loosely based on the exploits of Al Capone. Well, you know too much. I ain't gonna take any chances. You're hanging around with me, see? Jump! There he is, the video double crosser. These films helped propel Capone and other members of organized crime syndicates to folk hero status nationally. It is no surprise that this inspired others to follow in Capone's footsteps. It is even less of a surprise that many pockets of the South would support the illegal liquor industry, as moonshine often flowed like water in the mountains. During the time Al Capone ruled over Chicago, Johnson City, Tennessee was earning its own reputation for illicit activities, from bootlegging to gambling, among other vices. Johnson City was a major crossroads for three railroads, which added to its appeal to organized crime for its easy access, as well as the ability for travelers to enter and leave without raising suspicion, unlike more rural areas of the region. In addition to the railroad traffic, Johnson City had more than doubled in population in 10 years, so it would have given easy cover to strangers coming into town. Johnson City was also a hotbed of illegal liquor production and was policed by a grossly undermanned law enforcement team. The stress on the police who often had 5,000 citizens for every officer on duty in the city of well over 25,000 people led to a massive turnover in police chiefs as well as difficulty in keeping the illegal activities in check. Long before DoorDash, local taxi cabs were used to transport liquor with many speculating that taxis were used more for liquor than for people. An editorial in the March 15, 1926 edition of the Johnson City Staff News described the dire situation placed on the police force while calling for fellow citizens to assist with the enforcement of the law. It went on to describe some of the challenges in law enforcement, including compromised government officials who profited from the illegal liquor industry, as well as the large local population who indulged in the liquor. This led to a lot of frustrations as raids were often tipped off, leading to numerous failed raids and earning the police force a reputation for being either corrupt or incompetent, further undermining their effectiveness and morale. Compounding the problem, local courts were handing out extremely light sentences when there were convictions, earning the mockery of cartoons in the local newspaper. In October of 1926, Johnson City Staff News Editor Carol King once again forcefully called on citizens to snap out of their apathy. In an article titled, Do We Want a Reign of Terror? King posed the question, Do you fully appreciate the tenacious grip the criminal and undesirable element is getting on Johnson City? Do you want the outside world to begin to see daily stories of lawlessness rampant in Johnson City? King went on to describe the apathetic citizens as giving encouragement to the underground organization which is seeking to strangle Johnson City, further saying, Today Johnson City is overrun with criminals, would-be criminals, thieves, thugs, gunmen, dope peddlers, and other undesirables working hand-in-hand -hand with the liquor ring. In no other city in the United States would this condition be permitted, but the situation only worsened for the next few years. Finally, in spring of 1929, Local, state, and federal law enforcement led a dragnet shakedown of speakeasies and other establishments suspected of engaging in the illegal liquor trade. The raid led to several arrests with approximately 1,000 bottles of homebrew uncovered in two establishments, which were broken on site. This dragnet slowed the flow of liquor as it marked the first time local, state, and federal officials worked together successfully to clamp down on the trade. Prohibition was repealed in 1933 and that continued the decline in demand for illegal liquor as it was once again legal to engage in the consumption of alcoholic beverages. 
Stories of Al Capone's appearances in Johnson City were focused in the mid-1920s on three primary locations. The Montrose Court Apartments, the Windsor Hotel, sometimes called the Hotel Windsor, and the John Severe Hotel. The Montrose Court Apartments was an apartment complex built in 1922 and was said to be the most luxurious apartments for hundreds of miles. Montrose Court is in relatively close proximity to the railroad, so it would have been an easy place to be transported for overnight stays. The doors to the complex were guarded and would have given plenty of time for hiding should there be any trouble approaching. Local oral legends claim that Capone engaged in card games at this location, and it is claimed that Montrose Court served as his local headquarters. Alrighty, so what you see before you is what is known as Montrose Court. And this was actually built back in 1922, but it is the number one spot tied to Al Capone. I love it. It is a gorgeous structure in it. I want to live here. Oh, yeah. So this just looks like a perfect place for an old traveling mob boss, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. So there's been stories that's gone around for years and years and years that Capone engaged in at least one poker match here. Cool. Yeah, at least one. So they're saying even if he didn't make it a regular stop, his henchmen most certainly did. Like I said mm -hmm. before that, even when I was in Chicago, Johnson City was just a notorious, lawless place back in the day. It was, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was little Chicago. It was where crime happened. And then unfortunately, to be honest, the police were pretty corrupt back then. There was all kinds of illegal moonshining activity and everything else. So I don't know why Capone wouldn't come here. Yep. And what I found is, <coughs> uh, which is true today too, if you're doing something illegal, what do you do? Well, you don't talk about it. <laughs> kind of like Fight Club. The first true. rule of doing illegal stuff, you don't talk about doing illegal stuff, so. True. Kind of a side view to just give you a little different angle of it. It's monstrous though, isn't it? I love it. There's a sign saying Montrose Court to confirm that we're at that location, right? Yes. I'll guarantee you there's people that live here right now that have no inkling about the supposed mob history. Oh, I guarantee it. You see a thing on there that says 1922. Oh yeah. Confirming the date it was built. Yep. Glad you saw that. My eyes are, ain't what they used to be. Let me see if I can zero in on that. Yep. I would love to see inside. We'll just take a quick look inside, didn't we? Mm-hmm. I don't guess we can get in any of the rooms, but we can at least see what the layout is. Mm -hmm. There's a notorious mobster, Melody. Mm -hmm. Elevator. Mm -hmm. An MC, which I'm going to assume stands for Montrose Court. What do you think? I think I'll be the guest. You can see some more pictures here. Old mailboxes here too, so look a little dated and worn, but yeah. what do you expect? It goes Still back to going. 1922, so it's 100 years old. Yeah. I did that math here just in my head real quick. Oh, good job. So. And here's the entrance. Mm -hmm. Majestic as can be, isn't it? it look is. at that. I can't I believe that this it. isn't something luxury, can you? I mean, I it just. Know. Can you imagine if they would remodel this into like a resort of some sorts? Oh, or? Yeah. I mean, like Hotel Roanoke. Yeah. Yeah. The Windsor Hotel was established in 1909 and had a well-established local reputation as being a great place to find the vice of your choice. It is another location where stories of Capone engaging in a game of cards has centered. The Windsor, unfortunately, was demolished in 1971. The John Sevier was a 10-story hotel that opened in 1924. The hotel hosted celebrities such as President Herbert Hoover, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, as well as actors Gabby Hayes and Tyrone Power. It was also said to have hosted Al Capone. Like the Windsor, the John Severe was in very close proximity to the railroad depot and would have been a very easy stopover for the mob boss. So what you see behind you is the former John Severe Hotel, which was a very well-known prominent hotel back in the era of little Chicago days. And it's reputed that Al Capone made some visits here and had a base that ran out of this operation. So I want to show you that. It's now public housing but it's still standing. And there was another hotel very much like it. It's called the Windsor Hotel, which has now been destroyed, unfortunately. But I love seeing these things still intact, but obviously with this current situation, you can't go in there and look around, but it shows you a little idea of what it looked like back in its glory days when it was built as a major stop. And of course, John Severe Hotel, you know, Little Chicago, 
the uh, train station was just right down the road here. So it was very easy for people to get off the train, get into the hotel, and which would have included some of Al Capone's henchmen, if not Al Capone himself. Now, this was a stop on the way toward Palm Beach and Miami and that area down in Florida where he was known to have some operations for bootlegging and other nefarious activities. A little background information on the hotel. It was built in 1924 and it was planned in three different stages. So it opened up 1924, then they put a second section in in 1929, and then they put a third section in that was that was planned. Actually, they didn't put it in. They planned to do a third one, but it was not actually completed because of the Great Depression. So it was known as a million dollar hotel. It's quit operating as a hotel in the late 1975, and from 77 to 78, it became apartments for senior citizens. And then it actually was had a horrible fire, 1989. 16 people were killed in that because of smoke inhalation, but after that, it's been reopened again as public housing. So why would Al Capone come to Johnson City? For one reason, it was a perfect stopping point between Chicago and his home in Miami Beach, Florida. Secondly, since his crime syndicate engaged in bootlegging nationally, Capone was known to travel to meet and negotiate with locals to distribute his liquors, and East Tennessee was known as a hotbed for alcohol production and consumption. Johnson City would make more sense than, say, Knoxville due to the severe lack of law enforcement, as well as having a sufficient size to keep a low profile. Also, even more than to avoid the law, Capone often liked to get out of Chicago and mix up his routes to avoid retaliation from his gangland rivals, and often for an alibi when some of his ordered hits were executed, such as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Long after Al Capone's capture, Johnson City's reputation for CD behavior lingered, even earning a ranking on Look Magazine's list of 25 worst Hot spots for vice in the U.S. in 1952. All right, so going back to April 7th, 1929, an issue at Johnson City Staff News, there was a big major raid. So federal, state, and local officers came crashing down on a bunch of speakeasies down here. And they uncovered large quantities of homebrew, and they ended up breaking 945 bottles by the end of that shakedown. So very much well earned the reputation and of course the attention of public enemy number one mr al capone but it was this was just a, had a very seedy reputation johnson city did back then for prostitution gambling and bootlegging so it would be no surprise it would be part of the criminal syndicate of al capone yeah all right guys we hope you enjoyed this look at little chicago or johnson city as you may more commonly know it as yes i know i just love hearing about all this and reading about it in your book legends yes. and lore of east tennessee thank you for plugging it you're welcome and also plugging our shirt original pocahontas oh, yes. cole yes yeah good time to snap up a, a good old hoodie because that's i would be right. freezing without this thing that's right that's been great but yeah what do you think do you think al capone was in town do you think he spent time at i think so building? i think definitely so i get sure. some like monster vibes here yeah, this has definitely had a terribly seedy reputation back in its day. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it had done now. But. Yeah, that's true. Yes. I can definitely see it. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this little story as much as we do. And if you do, give us the thumbs up, subscribe to our channel and our new channel, Real Shame and Shane and Melody. You call me Shame. Shame and Melody. <laughs> this may make it to that list. I don't know. But no. <laughs> yeah. So we will see you on down the road.